What's up and welcome to Idol Insights, a show where each week I, Trevor Best, talk to interesting people about Idol Champions and Dungeons and Dragons. Joining me this week is our amazing and awesome producer, Lauren Urban. Hello! Hi, it's me. I'm on camera again. Sorry. And actively <laughs> producing. <laughs> yes, I am uh, extra multitasking today. Uh, but this is, I don't think, the first time that I've produced and oh, guested. No. Oh, I, I mean, you you do you literally produce and guest or produce and host every week on uh, on uh, sketching hour. So like, true. You know. But I think there's a there's enough of a difference between being a host of a show with two other people versus being the guest on this show. I don't know. Maybe, it, maybe it's just me. I put on more makeup for this show. How about that? <laughs> Can't you Lauren, tell? If folks somehow don't know in the chat who you are, who you, ah, who you are, who are you for those fine folks who may not know? Hi, I'm Lauren Urban. I'm the content manager here at Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms, which basically means if it's something helping you learn about the 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 game, if it's a blog, if it is a video, if it has something to do with the Twitch channel, if it's something to do with the YouTube channel, if it has in-game alerts. And a bunch of other things. That's me. I'm also a professional classical musician on Oboe and English Horn when the gigs are there. And I do a whole bunch of other TTRPG stuff all over the place. That's Heck yeah. me. Heck yeah. Right now, you, you can hear examples of that uh, that Oboe on uh, uh, Champion Psychology every week with our disclaimer that comes up. Because Lauren not only reads it, but she played the music for it. Which, I, I, I know we're here to talk <laughs> about career and other stuff. That was one of those things where you were like, hey... Would, do you want me to like do a recording of reading it and you can just play that everywhere? Like, that would be incredible. Thank you so much. And then you send this track that also has this very calming and beautiful music in the background. And then you're just like, I just threw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, because when I, when, because originally it just showed up on the screen, it was just quiet and it was very ominous. <laughs> Because it's a serious disclaimer. And so when mm -hmm. I had offered that, I'm like, well, at least if I'm reading it out loud, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when I listened back, I was like, well, it's still kind of ominous because it's just me talking about, you know, all kinds of serious things. So no, that's... I really hope that you would just you were just like, it still sounds on ominous. It's just me talking. It, literally, uh... <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it you still are sounded ominous. ominous. It's just me. Well, OK, I, I guess I'll play <laughs> sleepy time music in the background. It'll be great. So I was happy to help. Uh, well, Lauren, you know very well that I do a little icebreaker question at the beginning of the episode. Uh, and I got a surprise question for you because it's a new one that I haven't asked anybody. Ooh. What's your favorite magic item in 5th edition? Alchemy jug. Oh, I knew you were going to have this one ready to go. Why Why is the alchemy jug your favorite, uh, favorite magic item? Because it's the most ridiculous thing when you think about when you think about kind of classic magical things, you know, even people who are not really into D and D, who are just thinking about fantasy tropes, you think of the the glowing sword and you know the Lord of the Rings rings, um, or you know potions and all all this other kind of like seriously useful stuff. And then in D and D, what comes along is a jug that can make two gallons of mayonnaise, and I love it so <laughs> much. I love it so much. And what I love about it is it makes enough other things besides mayonnaise, which I have found to be useful in combat. It makes enough other fun things and useful things. Like it makes water, it makes oil, it makes beer, it makes other things that you can yeah. use in role play in a bunch of different ways. That it is an actual useful magic item. You just sometimes have to be a little creative about it. And then, and then it makes two gallons of mayonnaise, which is just... The best. I, and so, yeah, every single uh, I do a lot of one shots for charity events and uh, mostly charity events. And when we're given the option of having a magic item or two, immediately the alchemy jug is on my list. And it's almost all my characters have it there so that uh, when and if I can use mayonnaise in a creative way, I am there. <laughs> I'm ready. I, I don't know if we've talked about it on the show. I know we've talked about it on some show at some point, but we're going to talk about getting it if it was this one. <laughs> you I'm, and I talking about I stuff? I am nah. devastated that the best use I have ever seen of an alchemy jug, specifically by you, <laughs> was on an episode of a show that will never be seen because of my own technical error. <laughs> oh, God. We, we, when we were doing yeah. Adventure's Guide to the Multiverse... Uh, you all were in a hallway that suddenly became like 
a mimic essentially and like was turning into like the mouth of a monster yep and you took the alchemy jug and just chucked mayonnaise directly into it mm-hmm. and there was there was a lot of disgusting things that happened from there <laughs> I believe I said the words, you surf down on a river of bile. <laughs> I, I believe that was a sentence you said. Yeah, I, I totally forgot about that until now. Yeah, I'm, I'm very well aware that mayonnaise is one of those divisive pieces of, of dressing, to whatever you want to use it for. Um, I, I'm also very well aware that I'm a very pale person. And so, yeah, mayo. Um, I, I also like, yes, mayo, I use it, but two gallons of mayo is just such a ridiculous amount that it is disgusting in, oh, yeah, in the no. best ways possible. The, the the sentence two gallons of mayo just turns my stomach. Uh, <laughs> recently, like, I, I'm, I'm not a fan, I'm not a big fan of the mayonnaise or anything like that. Uh, I saw how it got made once, and I went, that's it for me, I'm all set. Uh, that's fair, but, that's totally fair. But uh, recently I found sriracha mayo. And it is now my favorite thing in the entire world. And yeah. I put that on lots of things. <laughs> Listen, so the, the, the secret of mayonnaise is that even for those of us pale people who like it, it's best when used as a thing to make something else, like sriracha mayonnaise. Or like you mix it with all kinds of other stuff to make all kinds of dips and mm-hmm. things. Uh, I played a one shot literally last week in where... Um, uh, <laughs> Omega Jones, also known as Critical Bard, was DMing a game in where we were raising money for St. Jude, which uh, is a hospital that does amazing work with uh, chi- fighting against childhood cancers. And so we were fighting a bunch of crabs because cancer, because cancer, because mm-hmm. crabs. And <sighs> the discussion came up about having a, a crab bake afterwards, which immediately meant I got to pull out the alchemy jug and... <laughs> Uh, make mayo and then because one of the other players in the game rightfully called out you're not putting mayo on that that is the most disgusting thing (laughs) uh no what you need is hot sauce um the artificer was able to convince the dm to help turn the mayo into hot sauce and so now now my alchemy jug in that specific game also makes hot sauce I love that. Yeah, it's it was probably one of my most favorite moments with an alchemy jug, and I've downed walking statues with with mayo. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, this is the earliest I think I have ever pulled in a question on this show. Uh, but Gauntlet Blades has question: There are three versions of alchemy jug. Which is your favorite? I've been using the blue because okay. the blue has hot tea. Um, so Ooh. for those that don't know, there's the regular alchemy jug, and then there's a blue and, a, and an orange. Or an orange, yeah. And they make slightly different things. They all kind of make the the basics: water, wine, beer, uh, oil, and then I think the orange makes soy sauce, which is cool. Uh, but the blue one specifically makes hot tea. And so when Orkira was given, and, and look, we'll get it back to Orkira. When Orkira was given an alchemy jug because Todd didn't know what he was doing uh, and who I was yet, and then I, I made it everybody's problem, um, <laughs> I was able to convince him when the blue one came out to switch to that because having access to a, a bunch of hot tea uh, was something that I knew Orkira wanted. And so I've just gone with the blue one, but I think all three of them are viable, are viable options. And certainly having soy sauce would be real nice. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, well, I think uh, that's a good time to transition over to our normal questions. But also, I'm going to say, hey, in case you didn't notice from me pulling a question from chat, we're live. Uh, I'm remembering to say that, and that is 100% because uh, someone already asked in the chat if we were live. That was Rough Rider. Thank you for uh, asking me that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so in the middle of the show, there will be a chance to do a giveaway. Uh, our awesome mod, Gabe, will put a keyword into the chat, and you can enter for a chance to win 42 chests of your choice excluding Bahamut chess. But before we do that, Lauren, who's Orkira? Are we talking regular Orkira or, th- or this one? We're, we're, we're going to talk regular Orkira for a moment. Okay. I mean, I have to assume that people, the vast majority of people watching this know who she is and know who I am. But, but for the like one person who is tuned in, who doesn't know, Orkira is a dragonborn cleric who worships the Phoenix, who is uh, in this timeline currently dead, but that's okay. They're Phoenix. They'll be back. 
And she was in a whole bunch of shows, uh, starting with Heroes of the Veil and moving through Silver and Steel and was on uh, D4. And and then Heroes of the Plains and then has done guest stuff. Uh, She showed up on uh, Idol Champions Presents Court of the Raven Queen. Um, She did the Adventures of the Multiverse. And she is available as a champion in Idol Champions along with the rest of her fellow Heroes of the Plains. Um, she's a weird looking dragonborn because once again, Todd Kenrick, love you, Todd, uh, within like the first five or six episodes of the show, she got mutated and gained wings and a tail and spikes and grew and is now this kind of awkwardly weird dragonborn that everybody thinks is something else. Um, and she loves to, she's, she's the classic support cleric. She likes to... Uh, support her friends and keep everybody safe and has a perception that is ridiculous because she knows that all of her friends will just rush off into danger and she can't stop them from rushing off into danger. And even if she could, they're usually rushing off to go be heroes and do heroic things and help other people. So she has decided that the best way to help her friends is to see the danger before they do or hear it or smell it so that she can be prepared to keep them safe. (laughs) <laughs> and that is that is Orkira in a tiny little nutshell. I think the the most recent place you could see her uh, was the finale of D four, which happened in January, uh, where she helped save Waterdeep and Faerun with her friends again. Yeah, uh, again, I love that. <laughs> you know, it's Waterdeep. How many times? Yeah. How many times has Waterdeep just been? Yeah, <laughs> gone. Uh, I do want to actually uh, call two things in the chat. Uh, let's see, where, where did that person say? Uh, ah, Gauntlet Blade said she's the best champion in slot one. We all know this. Uh, and Shivek well, uh, uh, 74 says Orkira is something special. <laughs> I, I appreciate that Orkira um, is a fairly powerful champion in Isle Champions. I'm not going to lie. That is 100% the devs doing awesome things with her. Um, I, I feel very, very lucky that she is, um, powerful and useful. I wouldn't say she's the best in slot one because there's enough champions out there and there's enough, uh, adventures and variants and things that sometimes using different champions in that slot is good. Um, and sometimes you have to because, uh, she's not available for everything, Although when we talk about this, that that might change a few things, but um, <laughs> she's not available for everything, including and specifically Strahd variants, because you have to have a Storm. specific amount of intelligence and she does not have that. <laughs> and, and I get asked on a semi-regular basis, hey, when are we going to get a feat to bump her intelligence so that she can be in a Strahd variant? And my answer is never. And the reason is because the feet would need to be like a plus five. Her oh intelligence, my God. Her intelligence is eight. <laughs> it is her dump stat. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think there is a feat out there that is big enough to get her. And, and she's she's available for all sorts of other things. So it, it's fine. Go use um, Voronika's in that same slot. And um, uh, Nahara can be used in all the Strahd variants. So get, get yourself all of the Black Dice Society champions and use them in Strahd. And Orkira can do other things. It's fine. There you go. She doesn't need to hog the spotlight. <laughs> um, well, uh, we we all love Orkira. Uh, uh, I I absolutely do, especially having had her in uh, in a game. Uh, actually, that was a few such games. a fun game. You were you yeah. were such an amazing DM, and every oh. time I play Orkira with a different DM, I'm just surprised by the things that they pull out that has never come up, and you were no exception. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Orkira definitely surprises me because when you, do do you, how what is her passive perception? It depends on the level, but I believe when you, we played, we were seventeen. Yeah, seventeen or eighteen. Uh, it's a thirty-two. <laughs> and, I think I once just dis- and oh, that is normal. She'll also often cast um, enhance ability on herself and give her. Whichever, I think it's Owl. No, Owl's the Wisdom. Whichever's the one that gives you the bonuses to, um, yeah, it would be Perception. Yeah. Um, because when you have advantage, so um, Enhance Ability gives you advantage on certain stats. And if you have advantage on a stat, it adds a plus five to your passive. Jeez. This is all rules as written. So when she has Enhance Ability on her, 
um, then her passive perception is a 37. And yeah, I think I once described Orkira being able to see through walls like it was the Matrix. That uh, was that was uh, Yang Yang's character put. Um, was it? Oh yeah, it was because he was playing uh, Stonk in a charity game. Yeah, yeah. That was the other time we played. He put. Oh yeah, you um, got up to like a forty because he put um, uh, one of the sites on Orkira, yeah, yeah. one of the things in where she can just see everything into the ethereal and all of that, Absolutely and that also bumped wild. up her passive, and so she had a passive of forty. Good <laughs> lord. Uh, but what again, I was gonna know, say, but that's also what, why she's anxious a lot of the time. Is she kind of sees yeah. and hears and smells and tastes and touches everything all the time? So yeah, it's a little overwhelming. Uh, what I was gonna say, that was like you know, uh, we we all love Orkira, and I, I especially do, which is why, of course, I killed her off in an uh, adventure of uh, Fortune's Wheel. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, you're the third DM to kill her off and then bring her back. So. That, hey. That's okay. It's fine. It's, it's you are now in a long and uh, uh, established <laughs> line of dungeon masters who've gone. Cleric. To be fair, I almost did it on one of the shows, so it was very close. I think you had like one hit point or something. Well, uh, you, so you technically you downed her. Yeah. Um, the lich downed her, but she didn't go. She was in death saves. She wasn't. That's right. That's right. Um, and yeah, yeah. She because that was the game in where she wasn't high enough to have her own death ward. And that's the other thing about Orkira. She'll death ward everybody else, and then and then the bad guys when they're smart, they go, "That's the cleric." And then the next thing you know, I'm getting just pummeled. So <laughs> it happens. Yeah. So uh, yeah, w when we when we were going through what uh, Arcura's re new form was going to be for folks who don't know who may have not gotten to the Fortune's Wheel adventure, uh, the champions are glitched. Uh, there's something wrong with them, uh, and it is uh, permeating through the multiverse. And so when they die, they come back as another form of themselves from a different part of the multiverse. Uh, and so. Uh, or Kira came back as an Aarakocra, uh, which is a little more like form fitting to uh, you know the the Arakira that we're used to. I still absolutely love the fact that the the first uh, uh, incarnation was just you yep. as a, as a half elf. <laughs> I I was I was very kind of tickled when that happened, and it's still weird every time that skin comes up to see something that kind of looks like me as this character that I've played. Because the joke this whole time has been like. How do you cosplay as a gold dragon born with wings? It's difficult. Um, what I love the most about it, though, is that that version of Warkira just like floats up into the air for her ultimate. And I know. Just like ah, and fly. <laughs> and it's and, and the the cannon thing is she just casts fly in herself. Yeah. But you know, so yeah. Now now she is she's this, and I didn't <laughs> I didn't come up with Aarakocra on purpose because of the wings, uh, but after seeing Hef. Elf glitch Aarakocra just kind of float across the screen. I'm like, oh, that'll work. That works better. Okay. Uh, what was the uh, inspiration behind, like, the look of this skin, That that the notes that you gave the artists? So the reason I went Aarakocra is because of the, <laughs> the weird bits of lore that this Orkira is. So mm -hmm. um, this version of her is taken from what she was going to be originally way, way back before I started playing her, she was going to be an Aarakocra. And then one of the oh. other players in the group wanted to play an Aarakocra. And I went, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Cause I, when I'm joining groups, especially for longer campaigns, one of the things I really like to do is basically pick things that are the things that are missing find it easier to come up with a character concept when it isn't choose from everything everywhere. And so it's like, okay, we've got, um, we've got a fighter and we've got a monk and we've got a druid. We've got, you know, here's the stuff that we've got. What are we missing? Where can I put in? And also unless, um, especially with the non humanoid races, I find it useful to, unless we're going to do something story-wise, if someone wants to be one of those races, an Aarakocra, a Dragonborn, a Kobold, a, a Loxodon, like most of the time they're looking to do something pretty unique. And so I don't want to double up on someone else's uh, lineage choice. So that's why Orkira is a Dragonborn is because someone else wanted to be an Aarakocra in the game. So when we were talking about the glitched version of her, there were two things that came up. Well, 
originally she was going to be an Aarakocra, so we should go with that. Uh, and then the the story reasons that we kind of went down and the reason that she is evil is because this is the version of Orkira that is the other side of the phoenix. Because the um, what Todd and I had kind of come up with with worshipping the phoenix is the phoenix themselves are not an entity that has any wants or desires. They're, they're the truest of neutral. They're basically a, a, a force of nature. They have no inherent biases, wants, needs. They're just fire. And mm -hmm. fire can be useful or harmful, depending on the situation. And so it's the cleric of the Phoenix that helps guide their morality, in a sense. And so because Orc Arrow wants to help everybody, the Phoenix tends to want to help everybody. Well, there's another version of Orc Hero that just wants to burn everything, <laughs> <laughs> is the destruction part, and it yeah. is really into just, you know, I want to set the world on fire. So that's this version of Orc Hero. Um, and it's, <laughs> and then the, um, the version, the arrow cooker that you see up here is based on some hawks that you can find in Australia. Uh, specifically, I think they're called kite hawks. And there's, there's another one. I think that's one. right. Yeah. And so the look of them with the spots and everything, there's a couple of different kinds of, of hawks. But what was, what I had learned is that there are these hawks in Australia that have learned that when wildfires happen, all the little critters in the underbrush run. And when they run, it's easier to catch them. So not only will these birds of prey hang out by the edges of forest fires and brush fires to get easy prey, some of them have learned to pick up sticks that are on fire and fly them elsewhere to start fires so that they can get easy prey. It's a hundred percent real. Like, just look up. Yeah. Uh, if you look up firehawk, I think it comes up. But like, just look up Australian brush fires bird, uh, and kite hawks are are some of the ones that they have documented evidence of watching birds do this. And I'm like, that's well, there wild. you go. That's that's what she is. That's that's this version of Orkira is the one that what she's doing isn't evil. Like, hawks have got to eat. And brush fires, like in her her version, yeah, you know, it's evil. She's just setting things on fire just to watch it burn. Uh, but yeah, that's so. That's what she is uh, in in this version of her. I love that. No, when, when you were telling me this concept, uh, it, it brilliant, like just out, utterly brilliant of the connections between those for the look, what she is, the other side of the phoenix, and everything like that, like. Uh, you know, most of the time when we when we when we do a skin like idea, like we're just like, hey, we just got like a cool wacky skin idea, like ah, it's B Dave as an Azabar, and this felt like a fully fledged character that would show up in a stream, like. <laughs> <laughs> it, like if it helps, the uh, half elf version of her is it looks like Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> and I've certainly uh Orkira's got some skins that are the Oh yeah. You know, oh, she got turned into an owlbear during Court of the Raven Queen. Owlbear version of I her. I love those skins. Y yeah. The witch light version of her is the one that actually I find the most amusing. It's the first skin that she got in the game. Mm -hmm. Orkira has actually never been to the witch light carnival. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one and where I'm like, well, I need to get her to the Witchlight Carnival somehow so that I could talk about And her. into that outfit. And into that outfit and with the cotton candy and everything. Uh but yeah, this was this was a lot of fun to come up with that that version of her. Um here I'll show the the full artwork again. So the other thing about her that I don't this version. Mm -hmm. uh, she is still a cleric of the Phoenix, but she is no longer a healer. She's basically the light cleric that can set things on fire. So if you're a light domain cleric, you get fireball. Um, and she's actually wearing heavier armor and she's got the sword and she she's the kind of cleric that goes running on in, smacks people with a sword, sets them on fire, like kind of all the exact opposites of our, our normal lovable orc era. Um, <laughs> And and then she's got the book of the phoenix and has convinced the phoenix to just burn the world down. It's great. Hey, yeah, you know, just in their spare time. You yeah, know, whatever. Just for funsies. <laughs> I mean, it'll come back. That's the purpose. So hey, it's all fine. 
Oh boy, uh, Gauntlet Blade says, I'm surprised you guys haven't done an ICP oops all glitches. Uh, I'm not reading that out loud to say that would ever happen, but dang, that's a cool idea. <laughs> Listen, on a, on a regular basis, I, I know I've thought about it and a bunch of us who have these glitch skins have thought about like the alternate universe version of these characters. Um, it would definitely be interesting depending on where... Uh, who else I play with, if I was to play this version of her, I would definitely need to, like, go the lawful evil, I want to still help my friends route, because yeah. y you gotta be careful about, you know, doing evil things in a campaign with characters who are not all on the same page of being evil. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely want to massage what she does to be less about being just, like, mwahaha evil, uh, and more about like, no, fire is a good thing because you can't heal the underbrush until it's been burnt away. So we're just yeah. going to, you know, burn the as whole town love, and then rebuild it. It's great. As much as I loved uh, Baldur's Gate 3 and at, at the table, it's not just uh, your party member disapproves of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is an argument. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But I think I think that would be a ton of fun, um, and especially some of the other uh, Heroes of the Plains who have had glitch characters who are already versions of them. You know, Averin was a glitch character before he had a glitch skin, so there's all That's kinds true. of stuff that could work out. Um, but yeah, it it is sometimes hard to get that many people together in one place at one time. So oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what? What are the questions though that I wanted to ask about uh, evil or Kira? Uh, because uh, so, so the reason we're we're saying this is because uh, the skin uh, comes with a feat to change her alignment to evil um, and make is... her count as an Aarakocra too. So, true, true. Which is, doesn't break anything in the game whatsoever. Absolutely not. Not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I wanted to know, well, like, it, you know. What might this evil or Kira's like? Say that she was uh, the 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 villain of a campaign. What might her scheme be? Like, what what is what is her end goal that the party is trying to stop? I really feel like like she's almost the mustache twirling. I just want to destroy everything, but it really is be because she's still associated with the Phoenix. Even though her um, her inclination is burn it all down, and when we rebuild it, it'll be better. So basically, her response to almost any problem is burn it all down and we can rebuild it. That's not always the best response. And when that is a whole world, or say a universe... You know, it, she, I wouldn't go so far as to say that she's got one of those evil points of view and where you're like, okay, I get where you're coming from, but you're going about this in the wrong way. But yeah. she's almost there. It's not that she, she thinks she's doing the right thing, the good thing. You burn down the forest so that new life can grow, but you can't get the new life until it gets burnt down. She just takes it to that ultimate conclusion of, well, if this universe sucks and there's all this wrong with it, let's burn it all up and start over and it'll be great. Let's burn the world tree. The new world tree will be way better. So I think it's probably something like that. It's probably where uh, we're stopping her from destroying everything, not because she wants to destroy everything. It's that she thinks what's going to come from that destruction will be better. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I'm I'm being told by Gabe in the uh, in our little doc that the giveaway is ready. So anyone uh, in chat, keep an eye out uh, for the keyword and uh, put that keyword into chat exactly as it is, and you'll be in for a chance to win 42 chests of your choice, excluding Bahamut chests. Uh, you can get uh, 42 or Cura chests. To, to power up, uh, you know, uh, what has been voted in the chat as the number one best uh, <laughs> slot one uh, or seat one, whatever the more terms we use, you seat. can get it for the, 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 the best best Dragonborn seat one. Uh, is she the only Dragonborn in seat one? Yes. Ha ha! I got you on that one. Yeah, she is the only uh, Dragonborn in seat one. Oh my god, Gabe made it mayo jar. I love you, Gabe. That's god amazing. Dang. I love it. Yes, uh, also, for those of you who asked, uh, Evil Aarakocra or Kira does have an alchemy junk because everyone should have one. It's true, it's true. 
Uh, what what I was gonna say though is that uh, like oh, you know, you're you're making me think. I'm like, oh, you know, and this won't make sense for everyone if you haven't seen some of the multiverse shows. And uh, but if I ever have another uh, evil Mrs. Fox show up, I'm tempted to have this in this uh, version of Rakira with her, uh, because like that kind of feels like something that would go along. Uh, uh, viewpoint wise <laughs> yeah I mean from what we know about evil Mrs. Fox she, she's she got a very I don't know how much of the burn it all down in order to make a new one I, I think she's just about the burning it all down I think I think maybe well, evil or Kira sort could of. convince her <laughs> like okay I, I don't, burn it all down to start over you know I don't know if I ever said it on the show and I don't mind saying it here their original plan was actually merging all multiverses oh. into one okay um and so that by way of like you know some of them will be destroyed but at the end there will only be one mm -hmm. um sort of thing Okay. Highlander of multiverses. <laughs> so yeah, I think in that case, probably the thing that Orkira would advocate for is not the, you don't necessarily have to destroy the versions of the multiverse that you don't want. Let's burn it down and reform it into something that now will be helpful when they merge. Mm -hmm. Like that would be kind of her thought process. Yeah. Um, Evil Lorkira has never actually shown up anywhere, but a bunch mm -hmm. of years ago, I did run a one shot, and, and a tiny bit of this is where some of this has come from. I ran a one shot that ended up, um, it was a charity one shot that all the players wanted to play uh, Clerics of the Phoenix, because I have a subclass that is the Phoenix subclass. And mm -hmm. so they wanted, it was a very, it was a wonderful game. It's like one of my favorite things that we've ever done because all the players they they basically asked for a serious charity game which almost never happens and then they all wanted to be clerics of the phoenix uh which was amazing that i got to run that and so basically what i put them up against was someone who was gathering all of the different um elder elementals not just the phoenix but mm -hmm. there's the tempest and the the turtle that I never know their real name because it's, it's the, the 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 turtle that's the Earth one, um, and it, basically gathering the powers of all of them up um, and destroying stuff in the process. And they they had a similar philosophy of like um, destroying everything to reform everything. And so there was a there was an interaction at the end with mm -hmm. the big bad and all of the players of them trying to basically um, influence each other's point of view of like, well, but you worship the Phoenix, so you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes you just got to get rid of everything. So there's like a little bit of that that came forward uh, with, with this skin. So I, I like think about that. these kind of things a lot. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You, you, the, 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 you know, my writer heart sings for that. So I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, ch ch shifting gears here a little bit. Uh, you've been playing with the Gary Con crew mm. on Sundays. Tell me about that. Cause yeah. I didn't, I'll be honest. You said that today. I'm like, I didn't know that was happening, but I've been, uh, you know, MIA from social media for a while. So. <laughs> And it just started. Uh, so on Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific, um, Gary Con, the, the, the crew from Gary Con have D&D &D games and they've been going through a bunch of different games in like seven, eight, nine episode campaigns. Mm -hmm. And right now they're going through uh, Luke Gygax actually wrote a whole series of adventures that um, the people that, that we're going through. Mm -hmm. And I got asked to join for this latest one, which is kind of the second of the adventures. So even though it's a new campaign, some of the players are playing existing characters who've come from kind of the, the book one of this adventure. Um, and so we, we've only had two episodes so far. It's a seven episode series. And I'm playing a, a tabaxi paladin and the, the tabaxi paladin, um, I'm basically trying to make them just like the the happiest, the, the most chill paladin, the like, I'm here because I love life and I want everybody to love life. Like try to break that stodgy paladin mold. Um, 
and also he has a um he has a reach weapon because I I wanted to finally experience the joys of Sentinel with a reach oh weapon. Oh god. Yeah. It, it, Man, one one of the players in in the game that I'm in right now has a, a, a reach weapon, and I just every time I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Nope, that is difficult. That is a threatened square, and they moved through it. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sentinels is brutal. Um, and the nice thing about it is, like, I tend to be a theater of the mind player when uh, when possible when I'm DMing, um, and I I love combat, but I tend to the combat is of the three pillars there. It's not usually when I'm DMing the most important of the three pillars. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas this crew and this adventure is very combat heavy. Uh, and we're using fantasy grounds and we're hardcore like measuring. And, and so it's kind of neat because it's giving me that experience. That's almost equivalent to sitting at the table with, a huge dwarven forge set and minis and maps and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so that's, it's been fun to role play with all the other players. They're, they're fantastic. And we've all kind of had fun and it's a, it's a serious adventure, but we're a light hearted ish crew, which is my jam. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun to just uh, go in and just all I'm doing is stabbing folks. It's great. Uh, I'm slashing and stabbing and uh, being a front line. And yeah, yeah, he's a lot of fun. And um, the weekend that I came, that I created him for this character, for this campaign, I have, spoiler alert, I have another campaign coming up with a different group of people that's going to be starting this summer at some point that uh, I ended up that weekend creating both characters at the same time. So the the Tabaxi Paladin that I'm playing in the games on Sunday with the Gen with the Garycon crew uh, has a sister that will be showing up in another game. So oh, that's so cool! Yeah, so I, I kind of they're two different universes and two completely different DMs and like one yeah. is a homebrew and one is you know but but at least they've got this this connection in their backstories. So I'm having I like that. I kind of had fun coming up with that at the same time. So, d did you say what uh, what kind of paladin he is? Oh, he is a oath of the. It's the ancients. Mm, um, it's a goodie. Yeah, well, and like I said, I didn't want to do the stodgy paladin route. I didn't want you know, I I didn't want the the serious cliche lawful good paladin, yeah. and um, I also. I don't, I like being a support player. I, that is kind of my jam. I, I gravitate towards that. But I want, and so I can't, I almost can't not be a support in some way. Like even Idovan, for all that he is punch people in the face, is essentially a support <laughs> monk. Yeah. When you come down to it. So let me keep punching this white dragon in the face so it's not breath weaponing my friends. Yep. <laughs> I am not going to kill this dragon, but I can keep this dragon very, very. <laughs> you guys distracted. doing anything over there? You got it's everything's fine. <laughs> I'm exactly. just going to keep punching this dragon. <laughs> I'm dancing out of the way and make it all upset. Um, <laughs> so when, so when I was creating this character, once again, the thing that was missing from the group was like uh, a strength build, and I was thinking about a bunch of different ones, but the paladin kind of appealed to me because I haven't played a paladin in a while. And the Oath of the Ancients, specifically, their tenets are all about um, enjoying life. That, the, that you are not just out there trying to do good for good's sake or protecting mm -hmm. people because they deserve to be protected, which is all true. But also that people deserve to enjoy life and that you as a paladin should also be enjoying the life and the world that you are saving that yeah. to not forget about that kind of happiness and uh, revelry while you're out saving other people so that they can enjoy life. Um, Heck yeah. So yeah, that's so the, so my paladin is just kind of this always happy to be wherever he needs to be and is always, he's, he's almost a himbo. He's almost, <laughs> almost. He's I love not, it. I, he's not quite there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 
so he's heavily armored and carries a glaive and just I'm just having lots of fun basically becoming the front lines and going okay don't go past me you're gonna pay attention to me now you we're mm-hmm. dance partners oh you're trying to go away no nope <laughs> no sentinel yeah the the uh the only paladin i've ever played at a table i played a uh minotaur paladin of vengeance who was from ravnica uh the boros legion yeah. and i based him off of the rocks character from fast and the furious uh <laughs> perfect i love it uh, we're gonna switch over to some some questions here mm. real quick. Um, uh, th- this one is from uh, uh, Lopi seventy nine. Uh, the this this was a statement that I saw Cassius later request as a question. Um, we still need an orc Kira orc glitch skin and feats. What do you think about that? <laughs> you okay? You asked me about this in another stream. I appreciate the the word the punniness. Play. The very, the very punniness. Uh, I have no idea if we're going to do more glitch skins. Like, it's true. I, I have zero idea. Um, and then at that point, like, okay, that's super funny. But as you've probably seen with both of these glitch skins, and as we've talked about, unless I'm told, hey, we're doing this specific thing. If I'm told, hey, just come up with a skin and these are kind of some of the parameters, I tend to go hardcore story mode. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I could see... Or Kira as an orc. I there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it I would have to sit down honestly with a third glitchkin and be like, okay, if she's not this and she's not this, what else could I see that's still her um that she could turn into? And to be that's honest, fair. the uh the only reason the Aarakocra was so easy to well, pick was because oh, yeah. of the the history of what Orkira was going to be. Everything fell into place on that, yeah. It, exactly. Other than that, like if she's not gonna be the weird dragonborn that she is, I don't I don't have a preference. And like the half elf version of her that looks like me, she just looks like me. Like uh, I I don't even know who decided she was gonna be a half elf. It doesn't matter. It's <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. I don't but remember. like, I didn't choose that. That was just what she is. So yeah. Uh, so that'd be the thing. I'd have to sit down and come up with what's the story of who she is, and then is there a lineage that makes sense? But there's no reason she can't be an orc. It's true. It's true. Uh, this that was one a long-winded is... answer to no, a, a, a very easy question, which is. <laughs> Uh, Star Chaser 43 says, question, Lauren, you've DM one shots and charity streams played with numerous characters. Is there something you haven't done in TTRPGs that you want to do? Oh, there's so much. Oh, jeez, mm. there's so much. Um, I'll, I'll answer a specific Orkira slash cleric one, and then I have a, a couple more general ones. Um, I've been very lucky with Orkira to play her at a very high level of bunch. We were level 20 in Heroes of the Plains for many episodes. Uh, Todd very intentionally got us there so that we had at least a couple of episodes with combat to be at 20 because you don't often get that. Yeah. Or a lot of campaigns get to 20 and then you do like one fight and then you're done. Um, and then with Court of the Raven Queen and with our game and a couple of the, and, and even D4, um, where she was in the 16, 17, 18, 19 range, basically high enough to get access to pretty much all of the things that she would have access to. Um, there are still a bunch of things that she's not been able to do just because it's never come up. Mm-hmm. And the one specific thing that I've never been able to do is cast Mass Heal. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, ninth level Mass Heal. I recently, thanks to D4, got a chance to do the other one, which was True Resurrection, which I'd never mm. done before. Uh, but yeah, Mass um, Mass Heal. <laughs> if you, for those that watched Court of the Raven Queen, Court of the Raven Queen, the very, very last big, 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 big fight that I won't spoil a bunch on. Yeah. If you watch the um, Shaka went right before me and the stuff that Shaka did basically ended the fight. Yeah. The next person to go initiative would have been me. If it had gotten to me. To. 
Yeah, because a bunch of us were at like oh, one hit no. point. Well, no, no, like it's good. Yeah. Like I, I think narratively it made way more sense because Court of the Raven Queen was really the story was focused on Frida and Havilar, and then to a slightly lesser extent Shaka. So the three of them kind of, in in my mind, deserve to have as much of the spotlight as possible. But it's funny because that's literally I was in the middle of calculating all of the stuff for Mass Heal because if it had gotten to me, I would have dropped it and it didn't uh i still got to do all sorts of other fun things in that game and so no uh but that's the closest i've come so yeah as a cleric player being able to drop mass heal and be like everybody's got all the health for everything uh you thought you were dead and now you're alive and it's just it's such a cool if you're that kind of healer cleric it's so good um and then in general there's a bunch of Subclasses. I haven't gotten a chance to, to mm-hmm. play yet. Um, well, and, and we're getting uh, some, some new shiny stuff here later in the year yeah. for you to for one to play as well. Well, and I, I talked about this a little bit on socials. I'm very excited about getting my hands on the new version, the new version, the 2024 version of the cleric. Yeah. Because from what I saw when they put it out in UA, I actually really like a lot of the changes that they made. Um, I think they, they make a lot of sense. And if all of the changes that they've kept it, that they showed, uh, were kept in, I'm going very excited. Um, uh, did, did they, did they remove, I didn't get a chance to look at it too. Did they remove the thing for health or for life clerics where you could only channel divinity up to half health? Cause I don't know why that always irritated me. I have to look. I don't remember. Okay. Most of this it's, stuff, it's fine. We'll look at that later. Yeah, we can look at that later. Uh, yeah. And once again, like the the UA, who knows what they've changed since. Um, yeah. The thing that I remember, the, there were two things about that new UA. Now we've gotten off the topic, but yeah, just yeah. went tangent. Um, there were two things that I really, really appreciated that I hope they keep in. One was uh, guidance, because guidance is such a powerful cantrip. And I mean... It, it becomes almost a, a jokingly abuse of it. Like, for anybody that watched the Baldur's Gate cast play D&D with Mark Hulmes <laughs> and Shadowheart, so the, the actors who I play Shadowheart, guidance. like, immediately, like, all these people <laughs> never played so D&D much. before, but she knew enough about her character to be like, yeah. this is where I cast Guidance, right? Mm. It, yeah. But it's... It, it sucks when you have it because you feel like you're failing if you don't use it yeah. as often as possible. But you also don't want to be that player who's constantly being like, guidance, guidance, guidance. So the way they changed guidance in the UA is it's uh, it's still a cantrip. It's ranged. And you can, uh, you can use it as often. It's a reaction. That's what it was. It's a cantrip that's ranged and a reaction. And someone can only benefit from it once a day. So you can now use it in combat to give a buff to somebody. Uh, not, it's not just an outside of combat thing. Interesting. But everybody can only benefit from it once a day. So you can't constantly be spamming it. You do have to be kind of strategic, which I really like because I feel like that gives everybody... Yeah. I no longer have to be self-conscious about using guidance and being that person who's constantly having to use it. So I really like that. I hope that stays in. Um, The other thing that's cleric specific, um, I've been very lucky in where I've gotten to use um, divine intervention a surprising amount (laughs) for how it works, where unless you are a level 20, there's a percentage. Divine intervention right now if you try to cast Divine Intervention, you have to roll a uh, D100 and you have to roll your level or below in order for it to work. Unless you're level 20 and where it just works all the time. Uh, and oh, there's once per week. Once per week, yeah. But yeah. you don't have to roll for it. Yeah. Which means that it's, and you get that a level 10 and it's kind of this core ability that to be honest, doesn't get used very often because it's an action to use. It's a very low percentage chance, especially if you're still like level 11, level 12. So a lot of people don't even want to try it unless they've got either zero other options or are not in combat. And so you can kind of afford to just roll Mm -hmm. and see what happens. Um, So not only does it not come up very often, but then it doesn't actually work that often. And 
I, I have learned with Orkira, if I ask my DMs to do the role, it works. So I've had <laughs> Divine Intervention go off twice. Heck yeah. <laughs> because I've asked Todd and B-Dave to roll it. Um, they change the way Divine Intervention works in where... Um, I don't remember all the specifics, but basically there's no more rolling. It works okay. when you use it. It's just way more limited in scope until that you reach sense. like level 20, which that makes sense. I, yeah, I appreciate a lot because it sucks when you've got a core ability to your character that is uh, something that you get as a, a subclass level up that you may never use just because yeah. of, of a dice roll. Yep. Uh, well, we got to start wrapping things up uh, because we got a show coming up after this, and you have things to do. I do. Uh, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for talking with me today about Orkira and all, all this awesome, fun stuff. If people want to find you, you know what you do on the interwebs, where can they do so? Uh, go to my website, lauren urban.com, because anything that I'm excited about sharing uh, and my socials are all linked on the front page right there, and it's easier to send people there than trying to deal with all of the other things. So, lauren urban.com. I love it. Uh, yeah, that is going to do it for this week's episode. You can get the uh, Orkira glitch skin uh, in the store right now, and uh, as long as well as a bunch of other awesome glitch skins for other champions out there. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. Uh, thank you to Gabe for modding in the chat. Uh, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Idle Insight. So until next week, take care of yourself. Bye.